Okay, um, we are now going to start our bracket 50, a very reflective set of uh, presentations to celebrate uh, this very long history that BRAC has had, as long as uh, Bangladesh itself. And what we have today are three sets of speakers three, speaking about three different themes, looking at BRAC from three different angles. One will be just the history of BRAC and really a history of how a very small organization. Um, I did go and visit BRAC in the very early 70s and it was about, uh, you know, Mr. Abid and a couple of other people, including my cousin, and they had their office in a small little building in a residential area. Today, of course, BRAC is huge. Uh, it's been advertised as the largest NGO in the world. Um, and in Bangladesh also, it has many, many thousands of workers. Uh, so I think the history of BRAC is really how did an organization grow from that small in a very, very difficult period? And what kind of, um, you know, reflections, compromises, strategies did it have to make in order to become what is just by sheer durability, one of the most successful organizations in the world. And, you know, in Bangladesh, we've been lucky to have many different kinds of non-governmental organizations doing excellent work uh, at the field level. But I think BRAC has a number of lessons to teach us in terms of how you navigate your way through uh, all the sort of um, constraints of, you know, donor dependence for a long time, of a very poor country, of, uh, you know, tumultuous periods, natural disasters, and so on. So the first theme will speak to that. The second theme will speak to another aspect of BRAC that has been very consistent throughout, and that is its... Um, grassroots engagement with women and men from the poorest households and with a very particular emphasis on women and uh, and that too has been quite difficult because bangladesh is a highly patriarchal society so i think uh, the people who will be speaking and i'll introduce them in a minute uh, have all have had different experiences and insights into the kind of work that BRAC has been doing on that front. And finally, you know, we talk of BRAC, I certainly talk of BRAC as a learning organization. And it has from the very beginning, kept a record of, of what it's trying to do. So we have a, a working paper series in the days where we cycle styled uh, uh, papers. So you have this very sort of primitive form of technology and BRAC's uh, working papers going back to the 70s. But over the years, of course, it has polished, it has developed. And one of its most successful uh, interventions has been bringing lessons together of how you deal with that very, very hard to reach group, the very poorest. And so there will be, um, and BRAC has uh, pioneered an approach which tries to integrate the multiplicity of constraints that keep people in absolute poverty. So the third session will be about BRAC's uh, targeting the elder poor, which has become the graduation program. Um, one of the things I would like to say is when I think of BRAC, and I have been, as all the speakers that you'll be meeting in a minute have been, some have been involved very directly, they've been part of BRAC staff, some from the very beginning. Others are like myself, kind of fellow travelers who have been observing, researching. And one of the things I find um, about BRAC's history is its pragmatism. That I think Amartya Sen said that one of the reasons why Bangladesh has had an unexpected success is that it has never been paralyzed by the pursuit of purity that you find in very ideologically oriented initiatives, which either focus purely on the state or purely on private enterprise. BRAC tries to combine them. But what it has not lost in its history is A, that concern with justice for the very poor, and B, that um, it's a kind of an integrated approach that brings together economics, finance, and so on, but also legal rights, you know, building citizenship and, and that side of it as well. We don't know how successful it has been. I mean, you know, I, it looks to me like it's done extremely well, but we will have reflections from our speakers. Um, before I introduce the speakers, let me just say that um, there will be one more webinar to go. This is a part of a, the Development Studies Association pre-conference webinar. And there will be another webinar to go with, by the University College on the role of universities in shaping sustainable and just futures. And then, of course, we have the annual conference of the Development Studies Association from the 6th to the 8th of July, 
which is about just sustainable futures in an urbanizing and mobile world. And there is still time for people to register either for the, for the pre-conference webinar or for the conference itself. So let me just introduce you now to the first set of speakers. The three themes are going to be uh, the BRAC approach as a global southern enterprise. Uh, and I'm going to introduce those, the, the speakers for that. They are Shahadu Zaman, who will be going first. He's a professor in medical anthropology, global health in Brighton and Sussex Medical School. He will be followed by Asif Saleh, executive director of BRAC Bangladesh. And Asif will be followed by Tamara Abed, who is the managing director of BRAC Enterprises. So let me now call on uh, Shadu Zaman to um, open up the open up the the webinar. Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Naila Kabir. Uh, am I audible? You are. Okay. So uh, the the BRAC history project is still underway. Uh, so I will what I'll try to do is briefly mention some of the uh, highlights that we are trying to deal in this project. Uh, BRAC is a complex and uh, highly diversified development entity globally and uh, originated from Global South. And we it's, it's important to keep in mind that unlike other known INGOs, those were uh, originated in, in Global North in an advance, in the context of an advanced economy. BRAC was established uh, in the aftermath of 1971 liberation war in Bangladesh, uh, when, when uh, the, the state, uh, its economy and uh, its institutions were almost non-existent. And from that point, BRAC has evolved as the largest uh, NGO uh, in the world that uh, we have just uh, uh, discussed. And it has developed a model that uh, has been successfully transferred to other global Southern uh, contexts. Various forces, uh, of course, played a role, including the, uh, the support of the international donors, the leadership uh, of the organization, and, and, and the organization's unique way of uh, interacting with the local reality. And through this project, we are trying to understand and document those, those processes. And what we see that in, in order to understand BRAC, it's, it's important to understand the, uh, the embeddedness of this organization within the local history. And also important to follow how the life of this, uh, the individual, the founder of this organization, Sir Fazli Hassan Abed, actually intersected with particular historical junctures of this country and shaped the organization. We would not understand BRAC without understanding the political significance of the Bola cyclone in 1970 or the liberation war in 1971. The Bola cyclone that ha happened in 1970 and in one of the uh, coastal islands in Bangladesh uh, is uh, one of the deadliest uh, natural disaster in human history where more than 500,000 people died. Although it's just a natural calamity, but it also played an important uh, role in the regional politics. The cyclone happened at a point when the, the tension between East and West Pakistan was always uh, already in a, in a tip, tipping point. And uh, despite of this huge ca casualty, the then Pakistan government, the dominated by West Pakistanis, uh, remained indifferent to this particular effect. So this cyclone and the aftermath actually intensified the question uh, of, of legitimacy of the state and solidified the, uh, the need for uh, the then East Pakistan's autonomy. And just after a year, uh, through several political turmoil and a liberation war, Bangladesh emerged as, as an independent state. Now, visiting to that cyclone affected area by Sir Fosli Hassan Abed, at that time he was a uh, corporate elite and an aristocrat that actually had a, a life changing uh, effect. And he described how experiencing the suffering of uh, his own country people and his political significance actually transformed the life world, uh, his, his life world. And that's when he's uh, uh, got actively engaged in the humanitarian activities in that uh, island. And he started the first uh, humanitarian organization, HELP. And soon after the uh, 1971 war started, 
he, uh, Abed resigned from his lucrative job in, in, in uh, Shellwell Company and dedicated his life for the uh, cause of Bangladesh and helped uh, the liberation war and afterwards uh, established BRAC to rehabilitate the war affected people. What we see that this experience of uh, the Bola cyclone and the 1971 war actually generated a politics of belongingness and which ultimately shaped the organizational ethos of BRAC and also the way BRAC knows and practices uh, development. What we also uh, see that uh, over this last five decades, BRAC uh, has been navigating as a non-state actor, navigating through the state, through uh, donor, as well as uh, uh, the market. And uh, what we observe that BRAC always has uh, translated the, the idea of development by deeply engaging with the local reality, the needs of the local people, having a deep, deep listening to the people and facilitating the human agency. And uh, that's, and of course, BRAC has uh, uh, always had global uh, friends and allies, but there is a Southern way of doing, practicing uh, development and which needs to be understood through the Southern framework. Current BRAC is, is faced with a new kind of state, a new relationship with the, with the uh, uh, donors, as well as a new kind of globalized and digitalized citizens. Once in one of his uh, interviews, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, founder uh, Abed said that the future of BRAC will depend on how BRAC keeps itself relevant for the contemporary time. I'm sure that is what uh, the current leadership uh, is, is uh, trying to deal with. So thank you. I, I, I stop at this point and uh, I'll listen to the current leaders. As if you're on now. Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zaman. And I will kind of uh, touch on some of the very key salient uh, points that makes, I think, the approach of BRAC uh, different from uh, other NGOs or other development uh, like or similar organizations. I mean, I think the first thing I would say that I think BRAC looked at poverty um, as a complex problem that required uh, multi-dimensional solutions uh, and simplified solutions that works for the poor. So essentially it was not, uh, uh, not a one-dimensional problem of in lack of income, but rather uh, there are many different types of reason uh, for which people are poor. That can be social structure, network, that can be a lack of access to education, financial inclusion, healthcare services, many different things. So in all of these areas, I think that required uh, sort of a solution uh, and Professor Kabir mentioned the word pragmatic. I think that's very important. Pragmatic solutions, simplified solutions that uh, would be a multidimensional that would address some of these problems uh, for the uh, people living in poverty. So that, that, uh, that, uh, that looking at these uh, from a very different lens and not ask, looking for a magic bullet is a very important uh, distinction. And, and that required BRAC to look at social challenges in a way, um, uh, in a way more like a problem solver, which brings me to the second uh, distinguishing factor, which is um, its approach has been always much more longer term rather than short term. What I call it like rather than being proposal driven, it's actually a problem driven approach. Uh, looking at, uh, on, and, and in, many, in many of these cases, these, are, these problems are interconnected. So looking at the interconnectedness of issues uh, it was a very, very important part. And, and uh, it, it may have come up with a sets of activities by trying to resolve a problem, but then it saw that there are other sets of activities, other problems emerged uh, as, as we solve a sets of, uh, sets of issues, and that required a newer sets of uh, activities. For example, when we were look, looking at uh, the issue of population control, um, 
the first thing when we talked to the uh, families, the first thing they said that we have so many children in our houses because we don't know how many will survive. So, so that actually was interconnected uh, with a lot of different types of other challenges, right? So, so that means that if we are going to the root cause of the problem, uh, we needed to address the issue of child mortality. And that required us to get into this whole, everybody knows about the oral rehydration therapy, the solution for diarrheal disease, uh, that was the number one killer for children in Bangladesh, uh, and also a nationwide immunization campaign that happened in, in 80s where BRAC almost covered almost one third of the country uh, to immunize the children. And within just a few years, the immunization rate uh, went from 2% to almost 80 plus percent. So, so the interconnectedness is here that, you know, with the reduction of uh, uh, children in a household, you know, you have actually addressed a number of issues. I mean, the issue of women coming to workforce, women, uh, the issue of nutrition, education, and also income is, as in general. So, so then it went on to address other issues like the issue of education, looking at education as a whole, that why parents were not sending their children to uh, schools. And then uh, trying to address those issues one at a time in that model that it came up with. So again, it was a very pragmatic, uh, like a one room model without focusing on infrastructure, but more on sort of the very high end curriculum where we got the best experts of the world. But then the focus went on to how to deliver this very high quality model at a low cost setting so that the model can actually scale nationally. And this is where uh, the vision came in. So we actually, rather than being driven by the vision of the funders, we actually showed a different alternative vision on how problem can be solved at scale nationally. And third one I would say is that the very important bit that you know we looked at people, particularly people living in poverty as infinite source of um, capacity and opportunity. And then we believed firmly that they have capacity. Uh, I mean, what, what in our, all our program design, I think the essential part that there, there is that social capital that people have by being in the community. Uh, but then they certain, uh, as we are kind of introducing new sets of activities in an you know, economy that didn't have a lot of economic activities that required building up of the capacity. And, and, and as you mentioned, Professor Kabir, that our focus went on to women. And women were not only uh, the central point of our sort of target of our work, but at the same time, they were also the delivery uh, vehicle as well, in a sense, where there is our teachers. Um, and we ran at most 64,000 school at one point in Bangladesh uh, to, uh, to the healthcare workers, the volunteers, uh, they were all women. And you know, if you think about those early days of 70s and 80s Bangladesh, a very different scenario where women almost didn't wanna come out of their households they were kind of became a role model and bringing bringing a transformation in terms of uh, how women were perceived uh, in the society. So, so that this focus on capacity enhancement uh, was very, very central so that the, whether BRAC stays there or not, it didn't matter. It actually mattered that the capacity is built so that they can continue. Some of these teachers actually continued to become uh, like a, either a government school teacher or started their own schools even when BRAC left. And last one is uh, where Tamara comes in is the looking at sustainability uh, through market intervention as a whole. Looking at, uh, um, I think that's a very important distinguishing factor and I'll let Tamara discuss that at, at depth. Thank you. Tamara, back over to you. Thank you, Asif. So I will focus on one of the most fundamental ways in which BRAC has had a different approach than many, um, and that is its use of markets, um, you know, to further its work of poverty alleviation and empowerment of the poor um, through its social enterprises. And one of BRAC's first social enterprises was Arong. Arong is now Bangladesh's largest and most successful lifestyle retail chain selling handmade products and crafts, and it was started as early as the 70s um, to create market access for rural women and craftspeople to enhance their income and to be able to create more livelihoods in rural areas through crafts. Um, now, most of BRAC's social inter enterprise ideas and initiatives came out of listening to people on the ground. Um, and 
most were started actually within development programs. And, and because of that, as a natural extension, therefore, in sectors which are part of the rural economy, um, crops, livestock, poultry, aquaculture, crafts, etc. Um, it's only when they started to grow and scale, and it wasn't possible for the development programs to run these enterprises anymore, to manage them anymore, that BRAC separated them out of programs. Um, and this was only in, in 2007. Um, let me give you an example of how enterprise activities were identified and started within um, the development programs of BRAC, and then how uh, BRAC even built value chains and ecosystems um, to support the rural enterprises by micro entrepreneurs to flourish. In BRAC's work with microfinance, it felt that the women who were taking these loans were often not investing in the right things to allow them to earn enough on their investment to be able to pay back the loan. Um, and so Bragg started thinking about some models of micro -enter enterprises that these women would be able to run um, with some key inputs and technical assistance and training from Bragg. Uh, and poultry was one such an enterprise and Bragg trained women from its microfinance groups who were interested in poultry um, to start a very um, small poultry farm within their, uh, within their homesteads with hybrid chickens. Um, and so Bragg first started importing good quality day old chicks to supply these to the women, as these were not available in the rural areas, and found that these hybrid chickens needed to be vaccinated. Um, and so then Bragg trained one person from each village or community as, as poultry vaccinators, so that the women could get the service from this person. Um, and then link these poultry vaccinators to the government uh, offices, poultry offices, to be able to source the vaccines from. Um, as it did this work, it identified another problem, which was that a lot of these uh, fridges in which the government um, vaccines were stored in these government offices were out of order. And it, you know, sometimes it took, uh, you know, three to four months to fix these fridges. Um, and, and so then BRAC started, uh, BRAC um, hired and, and uh, deployed mechanics uh, all over Bangladesh so that these government offices could call them as soon as their fridges broke down, they would not have to go through the government procurement system, which took a lot of time. And then, you know, they would be fixed by these BRAC mechanics for free. Um, and then came, and, and so these hybrid chickens also needed poultry feed because they didn't eat, you know, what the local chicken, chickens ate, which is basically some worms and rice and whatever was available in the household. Um, and then, and then so, Bragg, Bragg found that, you know, for, for women to be successful in these enterprises in their homes, they would need good quality poultry feed. And then Bragg set up feed mills to be able to supply poultry feed to them. Um, then when Bragg started operating feed mills, it found that one of the main ingredients for poultry feed was maize. Um, and, and Bragg had to import that maize because uh, Bangladesh was not a maize growing country. And, and then Brax, uh, through its seed and agro enterprise, started working with contract farmers uh, and training them in how to grow maize and actually pioneered the, the sort of successful, you know, um, extension of crops, uh, you know, of maize in Bangladesh. Um, so, so the, and over the years, this, uh, you know, this, the, the, through Brack's success in poultry, a lot of, so Brack was the pioneer in sort of, you know, th this poultry farm chicken in Bangladesh, because none of the private sector had come into this. Uh, but over the years, a thriving private sector had developed in the poultry sector as, uh, you, know, uh, you know, sort of piggybacking on Brack's success and people found the courage to invest in this, you know, foray into this risky sector. And so in 2017, Brack decided that its work in poultry was done uh, and ex actually exited the sector. Um, so let me finish by, you know, summarizing some of the core purpose of, um, of why BRAC set up social enterprises. And BRAC social enterprises are set up to do any one or more of four things. Um, it's to create livelihoods in rural areas. Uh, it is to create access to markets for the poor. Um, it is to improve value chains and inputs for the enterprises of the poor. And it is to increase income and productivity of the assets of the poor, whether it's a plot of land, whether it's a cow or a pond 
uh, etc. So um, let me finish here. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you very much to our speakers. Uh, I'm going to throw it open for questions, but uh, before that, I think I, 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 you know, there are some words that have recurred in all three of the presentations. And one is relevance, you know, that what RAC has tried to do has been informed by the need to be relevant. Uh, the other is interconnections, how one thing leads to another leads to another, and that helps to build a, a kind of synergy between these different interventions. But I think at the at the heart of this is the other word, and I'm not, not sure if you used it, is, is bottom up. You know, the reason that BRAC could have been relevant, the reason that BRAC could have built a set of interventions that spoke to each other is because its information was coming from the grassroots. So it wasn't being imposed. And while BRAC has interacted, I think, with donors, donors have had to listen as much to BRAC as BRAC has had to, you know, take advice from the donor community. So it's been quite a, um, a complementary relationship. But I think myself, as someone who has studied BRAC over the years, it's that, you know, um, very grounded approach that has made the difference to why BRAC has sustained itself over the years. One other question, you don't have to answer it, it's slightly difficult, but one thing that strikes me is in 71, everybody was inspired by, you know, a new nation coming out of a traumatic war and so on. So you could imagine why people did very well, the NGOs did very well in those first decade. What is surprising is how the NGOs that have survived from that period have each fashioned themselves a kind of a culture that has allowed them to become, you know, thriving and so on. And I see BRAC's uh, advantage here is in the quality of its staff. So when BRAC sets out to do things that might be quite difficult, it is able to do them because of the quality and professionalism of its staff. So at some stage, I'd really like to hear from anybody on this webinar what it was that has allowed BRAC to uh, produce such a very professional and committed staff. I don't think it's the pay. I'm not sure they get paid any much more than anyone else, but there is some secret there that I think uh, would be worth investigating. Um, I'm going to look at the Q&A and I don't really, I, I just see somebody saying this is all very good and that we have a, a, a very good history of BRAC and a history of its enterprise. Um, I wonder if anyone from the panel wants to come in. No? Uh, sure, I mean, uh, Professor Gabriel, I mean, I, I wanna come into that uh, issue, uh, the, uh, the capacity issue of our staff. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I mean, I mean on both ends, I mean, absolutely. The, the listening from the community, I mentioned the reason uh, the school issue. I mean, all of these, uh, what are those problems that they're facing and the, how the solutions can come up? A lot of this came from there, but it was also, I, I would say, intersected with uh, sort of uh, the knowledge transfer also that happened because the founder also had a very global perspective of things. That was very important. I think I think that the fact that we hired a consultant from New Zealand to do our curriculum to make learning fun that was as much as a sort of the founder's vision of changing uh, the whole sort of dynamics of education from road-based learning to a very different types of learning. But the fact that they were not going to schools because of some very practical reasons like distance, uh, then uh, sort of they, their parents were not involved with the uh, children's education. They didn't know what was being taught. So uh, then they didn't trust the teachers. So all of that were, and the flexible timing, very, very important because children were supporting their parents in, in, in their farmland. So, so all of those actually solutions came by listening to the, the listening to the sort of our target, uh, sort of our program participants. So I think that combination is quite unique. And on, on our staff issue, I think the culture is a very big part of BRAC, uh, which is, as you said, that, you know, there, there is that can do a teacher. There is always that, okay, nothing is too big. Uh, no problem is too insurmountable. I mean, in a sense, um, it, it's just amazing how they get things done. Uh, I mean, that's very, very important. I mean, I think beyond, I would say beyond the professionalism, I would say that it's almost this can do a teacher of our staff 
is is what makes you know even going to the remotest part whether it was in is in uh, Uganda or in Afghanistan or in Bangladesh uh, you know you would see even even Rohingya camps we we actually get the farthest camps which is the most difficult to work in uh, we in in Liberia we got the like the schools which are most difficult to get to because nobody else wants to get there but you know it's our staff which makes it possible because you know there is that sense of purpose and then then we have to do it and so that is very very important part of uh, BRAC and that's it's kind of also changing generations uh, I think it's very important that sustaining it going forward. Sarah P just wants to ask about the process of exploring the BRAC archives. I think maybe uh, that's a question that could be dealt with by email or something. Mm. And, and, and we can just move on perhaps to the next, because that's a kind of technical question. Um, one thing I do want to say though, I think when you're talking about how BRAC listens and so on, I think that adoption of the joyful learning model in schooling is a very good example of listening because we know that in Bangladesh, a lot of the schooling was by rote, it was memorizing and it was boring. So creating schooling as a joyful experience, I don't know how joyful it was, but I know that lots of children seem to have enjoyed it. I think that is a very good example of how to make something relevant. Okay, are we gonna move on to the next? Thank you very much to all three of our speakers. I think that's a very good start. Uh, I'm going to now move on, move us on to the next uh, session, uh, and that this is about gender equality and women's empowerment, a critical reflection on the Quiet Revolution. The Quiet Revolution refers to the title of a book that the first speaker wrote in 1986, and I think she'll tell us a little bit about what was quiet about it. Uh, so our first speaker is Marty Chen adjunct lecturer in public policy, Harvard Kennedy School, and senior advisor, and actually was for a long time director of WIGO, the Women in Informal Economy, Globalizing and Organizing. She will be followed by Sohela Nazni, who's research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies at Sussex, and then Nobonita Chowdhury, who is director uh, of the Program on Preventing Violence Against Women Initiative and Gender Justice and Diversity at Bragg. So Marty, over to you. Thank you so much, Naila, for this opportunity. Um, from the very beginning, um, Abed Bai, I will refer to the founder as Abed Bai, uh, Sir Fazli Hassan Abed. He really saw women as the agents of change and he viewed women-led development as the secret to reducing poverty and inequality. Um, so as far back as Shala, the area where BRAC was started in 1972, um, the work began largely with women from poor households, also men, but largely women. So much so that when a English journalist came to the area, Shala area, two years later, she wrote that she saw what she called the seeds of a quiet revolution um, and starting in the village women's lives. And this included uh, women were receiving functional education, a la Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. They were beginning to save on a daily basis, just handfuls of rice to build investment funds for their cooperatives, which were also um, formed in Shala. And a year later in um, 1975, Abid Bai asked me to um, join BRAC to help plan and lead the women's program, which I did from 1975 to 1980. I should note that Abid Bai and I had worked together on cyclone relief after the Bola cyclone. So we were known to each other and I had been living in Bangladesh for some time. So during those five years, the second half of the 70s, with Aisha Abed, with Amino Alam and other BRAC colleagues, we developed the women's program, not just in Shala, but also in Jamalpur, sort of central North Bangladesh and Manikanj, east of Dhaka, which was, um, Oh, sorry, west of Dhaka, which was became sort of a laboratory for BRAC's integrated programs. And what we promoted was a mix of social development, 
we helped form organizations of women and women leaders inspired by the Freire pedagogy. And we introduced economic development, taking women's subsistence activities and making them commercial. As Tamara has just explained, poultry was one of those. And we started with the improved chicks and the uh, paravets who did the vaccination and built out the whole ecosystem, um, as she said, in poultry and sericulture, in embroidery and uh, weaving many, many um, areas. And I wrote a book on those early years called A Quiet Revolution, as um, Nyla has said. After 1980, Brack began taking what was planned in the 70s to scale. <laughs> and uh, notably in the fields of microfinance and health and education, but also economic development as Asif and Tamara have uh, presented. And we, the social enterprises helped to build these ecosystems around supporting women in their economic activities. And women remain the primary focus of Brack's work, whether it was as the target beneficiaries or clients, whether it's um, as those who deliver the uh, services. As um, Asif mentioned, women were hired as school teachers for the most part in the 64,000 uh, schools that at one point Brack ran. So this panel is going to reflect on how far the quiet revolution has progressed and how much it has changed the lives of women and the wider culture in which women live and work in Bangladesh. So to set the stage for the panel, let me provide a few indicators of gender equality and women's empowerment from the early 1970s to now. Uh, when we started working in the 1970s, women were not in the market. They weren't in the weekly markets. They weren't allowed to work in the food for work. They were doing housebound, homebound activities, but not out in the marketplace. So in the early 1970s, in Bangladesh, 16% of women were literate. Women's life expectancy was 46, six years. Women's labor force participation was less than 25%. And as I said, women were excluded from the labor market, the market economy, and from leadership roles by and large, most women. Today in Bangladesh, over 70% of women are literate and Bangladesh has achieved gender parity in school enrollment. Women can expect to live to 75 years of age. Women constitute 60% of primary school teachers in the country. Two thirds of women in one study uh, reported being involved in major household decisions and 40% of women are members of self-help groups or other local associations. There is no doubt that BRAC and other civil society organizations have contributed significantly to this progress for women in Bangladesh. However, there still is a question to what degree and in what ways have women been empowered? Has the focus of BRAC and other civil society organizations been more on what might be called gender equality on the inclusion of women and girls in development than on women's empowerment more generally? How much emphasis has been on women's collective agency and voice? So consider women's employment <laughs> for all the progress made the labor force participation rate has increased, but it remains just below 40%. Women workers are still mainly in agriculture, in craft and low skilled wage jobs. Relatively few are in the 
modern industrial sector, with a notable exception of those in the ready-made garment sector. But most of those are young, unmarried women. While more than 30 million, it could be more million, I don't know, uh, women in Bangladesh have received microfinance, less than 10% of rural enterprises in Bangladesh are owned by women. And those are mainly in tailoring, weaving and craft production, and mainly small single person or family units. Moreover, there has unfortunately been pushbacks to women's empowerment from patriarchal uh, elements in the society. And there have been setbacks in the progress made, including most recently during the COVID pandemic recession. So consider child marriage. Bangladesh still has one of the highest rates of child marriage in the world. Before COVID, nearly 60% of women between ages 20 and 24 had been married before they were 18. And this percent has gone up during the COVID crisis. So I'll turn this over now to Sohela Nazneen, who will reflect on the evolution of BRAC's approach to women's development over the years, and to Nobonita Chaudhry, who will reflect on BRAC's approach to women's empowerment going forward. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Marty. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so Marty has highlighted where Bangladeshi women were and where they're now, and also talked about in the 1970s when BRAC started prioritizing women and focusing on women, and also the Freirian agenda of collective empowerment. Uh, what I will focus on, it's divided on four key points. So the first point is about, of course, 1970s, it's a radical start. Um, is the radical focus maintained over time? So in the 1980s, um, BRAC shifted from that radical focus. And the focus, that's an organizational choice. And it's, we need to explore what's happening there in terms of why does the focus shift? Um, the focus becomes um, sort of focusing on individual women's empowerment through provision of information, provision of services. So in terms of health, education, credit, and also engaging women in market-led activities through home-based activities, but also um, sort of small enterprises. Um, this approach, of course, allowed BRAC to scale up quickly. So you heard from Asif and Tamara about the vision of BRAC in terms of scaling up, but also uh, BRAC always had a sustained focus on efficiency. Efficiency is one of its goals, and BRAC has retained that over time. Um, what is uh, important to kind of dig a little bit more that while this focus on efficiency and sustaining uh, focus on individual women's empowerment is very, very important, um, it doesn't always match with when you want to do collective uh, empowerment and build collective voice and agency, because that requires a different kind of focus on investment of staff time and energy. So I'm just going to highlight a few of the studies that were done on um, microcredit uh, delivery and a sort of analysis of how things have shifted for uh, women. So if you look at the studies from 1990s and then also in the last uh, few decades, uh, there's a lot of focus on has decision making power of women shifted within the household, which we see focus on uh, do women are become more aware about their rights, which we also see, but there are also these studies show that there are also tensions in terms of the parameters within which the staff had to deliver um, the work itself and the dilemmas that the staff were uh, facing in the delivery. So for example, how do you address when women borrowers face violence from their husband? Do you have that time and flexibility to address those issues? Um, there are also issues around uh, local patriarchal norms that sometimes you have to accommodate for the program to be able to function in that area, not face a backlash. Um, there are also studies that highlight for a lot of the staff, the focus on women 
they also view it as um, instrumental for success of the program. And so that's something that has always, um, uh, there has been a tension in terms of how you function as an organization. And the emphasis on service delivery and efficiency and scaling up may not necessarily always dislodge the way the staff may be viewing how you look at women's empowerment, particularly if you're emphasizing individual women's empowerment. Um, so let me move on to the next point. So this is kind of a setting of emphasis on women's empowerment itself. The next point is about basically, um, while this is happening, that doesn't mean that BRAC did not uh, address or completely left its expansive goals for social change. So if you look at the human rights and legal education program, that was innovative. In some ways, it helped to address uh, violence against women uh, in terms of individual women. BRAC also tried to build platforms for women to connect them to the local government. So if you look at um, Polishomoch program that was trying to do that, but these platforms were mainly for um, working with the local elite, not necessarily confronting social power structures or power holders. So reflecting on these choices, what is it about? So we talked about BRAC being pragmatic. So the stress on service delivery in the 1980s and 90s that helps BRAC sustain the program while it gets on its feet in terms of being able to cover its costs, right? You need to sometimes tailor your agenda. Um, the stress on not rocking the boat too much at the local level in terms of addressing local patriarchy and focusing on women's empowerment is to ensure that you don't face a backlash. Um, this not stressing too much in terms of collective empowerment is also about basically ensuring that you don't get embroiled into local politics. So that brings me to the last point. What does it mean for the future? You heard from Marty that Bangladesh has addressed successfully the first generation um, challenges, but now we are facing second generation challenges in terms of good jobs for women outside the home in terms of the bodily integrity issues that we talk about. And that requires a different kind of focus on collective empowerment where women collectively can organize and voice their concerns in the market. And also how do you counter the organized uh, patriarchy that we are seeing in terms of the religious forces that are coming up? That's a very different kind of challengers and we are facing a culture war in a sense that we have to counter. So what that means is um, sort of looking at, are we ready? Is BRAC ready in terms of these new challenges? So Nabunita will talk about these in terms of what's BRAC doing now and where we are going. So Nabunita, up to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Soela Appa. And I'm very glad to be uh, part of this discussion and thank you whoever joined in here. Uh, when hearing to uh, Marty Chen, I was thinking as uh, she had been the first one brought in here in BRAC to design women's development program, I may be considered as the last one during Abed Bhai's time who has been brought to lead and design such program. Uh, as many of our panelists already mentioned, when BRAC started in Bangladesh, it was a cyclone and war ravaged country with very bleak numbers from literacy rate to uh, life expectancy. And Bangladesh was almost at the bottom of the list for all those indicators in the world. So raising the number to girl child enrollment in school to almost 99% in a country, which then had you know five decades back only 16 percent women having literacy or raising the life expectancy of women from 46 to 75 in last five decades prove the success of the enormous amount of work which has been done in different sectors by government and organizations like BRAC and also why BRAC being a non-governmental organization had to scale up so much in those early decades of the newly born country in education, health, financing, and so on, when government actually did not have the capacity or strength to reach the remotest parts. And Dr. Suhela Nazmin also spoke about why it needed to unify women, turn this development work often as movements, but has the movement brought changes, you know, enough changes? Has, you know, can it be considered as revolution, silent or not? Of course it has, because astonishing number itself speaks for that. Has the change been enough? No. 
no chance to be complacent, no chance to stop. At least that is what our founder, Sir Fosde Hassan Abed, our dear Abed Pai, made very clear to us for the last few years before his departure. I was brought to BRAC to design a new program, uh, you know, to create a movement against patriarchy. Maybe, uh, you know, as Dr. Sohela Nazneen mentioned, you know, the second generation of challenges, maybe, you know, and, you know, how it's so much important now to, you know, target uh, patriarchy uh, and to, uh, you know, set your goal to change norms. And uh, keeping in mind the word patriarchy involves such a, you know, broad spectrum and it is such an overshadowing demon around the world that I don't think many would have dared to specifically target that. Back at the juncture of country's 50 years and its own 50th anniversary, when in many, mostly on women empowerment index, Bangladesh has become the examples for around the world, wants now to ask why in a country where girl child enrollment in primary school is above 98%, you know, in even higher than boys, uh, the women in workforce is still below 40% and alarmingly decreasing. Marty Chen asked that too. Why having made the world wonder with wonderful stories of resilience and success with microcredit and so many stories of families turning around with those small loans, women's access and control over resources are still so, so limited. Brack is asking these questions. Deciphering these riddles and solving them with consolidating sporadic successful treatments of last few decades as Dr. Naila Kubir said, BRAC is a learning organization and continuously questioning ourselves on these accounts rather than only focusing on numbers and analyzing the quality of our, our work with the answer to these questions is where we see our future work lie ahead. We'll end with one concrete example of the whole equation, which you know I tried to say. In our skills training program, we have been ensuring number from the very beginning. We have been giving training to majority of female students, giving them training on non-traditional skills too. But over the years, we have seen, we learned that only giving training does not ensure they would be allowed by the family to practice the skill. That does not, that, you know, that does not ensure that they would be given access to the market to sell the skill. And that doesn't ensure they would sustain in the trade when they are married, when they have children. So we are having to give them soft skills training, which includes training on interaction, confidence, financial management training, et cetera, link them with master craftsmen in the market or may go some, may do some infrastructural development of the market in lieu of them being welcoming to the women. We are doing couple counseling for our married trainees so that the husband or in-law support her in profession. As we have seen, married women face the most obstacles. You know, with all this, what we do, we always thought close engagement with different layers of society, keeping the intersectionality in, in mind is the most powerful tool for development success. Hence, we have also initiated a platform with elite leaders of the country of different sectors who want to bring change and take a stand against patriarchal practices, even when, as one of the leaders say, they are the unintended beneficiary of the patriarchal system. Just as we did in the 80s, brat workers literally went to each household and in 10 years from 250,000 children who were used to die from dehydration that, you know, we, we have seen zero death from that cause. We hope and we see changing the norms and questioning the patriarchal practices with close engagement with the communities along with whatever development work we do is the future. And that is the future we are walk, walking to it, you know, towards. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Nobonita. And um, we have a little time for questions. Uh, but let me also say that uh, I think between you all, you highlighted, I think, the dilemma that an NGO like BRAC faces. And that is, on the one hand, the need to become financially sustainable so that you are not dependent on donors for the rest of your you know, uh, history. But on the other hand, the time you need to put in if you are to build up this, uh, you know, Sohila called it the uh, culture wars, if you are to build up an alternative culture which is based on gender equality and is hospitable to the idea of women's rights. So I think, you know, BRAC has 
opted very strongly to become sustainable, but along the way, it has lost some of the time it could put in to developing women's groups, developing collective action at the, at the grassroots level. I don't know what the solution out of that is, but you know, it is a very real dilemma. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions, but Greg, did you want to come in with that uh, point that you wanted to make, or do you want to do it later? Later? Okay. Um, one is the strong focus on, this is from Sam Hickey, strong focus on women. How has BRAC managed to avoid the charge of responsabilizing women? In other words, uh, you know, sort of devolving responsibilities for poverty reduction and so on and service delivery onto women. So has BRAC avoided that? How has it avoided that? Uh, and the other comes from Jahid Noor, transition from education to employment is still a challenge. How does BRAC want to address this challenge? So anyone on the panel can uh, come in. Can I, I, think, I think it's time that, and BRAC realizes that too, that responsibilizing women or just considering women as the sole agent of change will not actually bring enough change. And that is why, you know, uh, questioning the norms, changing the norms, changing the traditions, which are harmful for the society, which are patriarchal, that's very much important. And that's where, you know, our work uh, lies. That's where we want to engage the society. That's the discussion we want to start in the society. And, uh, you know, if I even uh, uh, answer the question by Jahid Noor that yes, that's the biggest challenge now, you know, linking from education and should we say education because we see a very large gap uh, from, you know, the primary school enrollment to the uh, girl children who can actually, you know, go to go and finish the middle school. So, you know, why, why the dropout and why, you know, we cannot ensure the, uh, you know, high level of enrollment, which we have ensured in the primary school throughout, you know, so, uh, as Marty Appa rightly mentioned, that Bangladesh is one of the uh, countries with highest rates uh, of uh, child marriage. So uh, yes, the transition has many, many gaps. And I think uh, Suhail Appa rightly mentioned, the second generation of challenge uh, lies in uh, addressing the second generation of uh, challenges. And those are the patriarchal uh, challenges. So norm change is the way forward and BRAC realizes that BRAC uh, work in, you know, includes uh, works on that in you know, everything it does uh, uh, in its fifth decade. Does anyone else on the panel want to come in? Uh, on that question or on any of the anything, other? Anything. OK, so there is uh, another question in, in the Q&A box, which is about BRAC, what is BRAC's main takeaway from community engagement? Um, because for gender equality to promote push that, there is sort of the cultural norms and issues that you have to deal with. Um, I, I think there's no clear cut answer in terms of answering that question. One is, of course, what, what are the kind of norms that you're dealing with and what can you push given what is it that you're, you're facing, right? So for example, in terms of uh, violence against individual women in, in the credit cases and what was happening. So there, as, as you're hearing from the community and what is going on and as your workers are flagging what may be the issues behind why that is happening, um, you, in a way your response needs to be programmatic, but at the same time, you can't sort of create a disruption in the whole community because then you won't be able to function. So it's a tight rope that you walk in terms of listening to what's going on, but understanding what can you, what can be pushed. But at the same time, then that brings up the issue of certain things may, you may push immediately in terms of if you have a legal aid program and you're pre giving, providing legal aid services, just the fear of that at times sort of um, ensures that but women are not facing violence. And we have heard that in our studies in, on intimate partner violence, sort of talking about, well, you know, you guys have empowered women too much and now we can't do this, right? So there's, there's that grumbling. Um, but there's also the bit about then what are the issues, where issues are so extreme and stuff that you can't push or it's not the right time, then when is the right time? You know, how long do you wait or do you make a radical 
push and say, we are going to kind of do this. And how do you bring the community on board for that? Yeah. And, and that's where then you have that approach in terms of what was being talked about, that different segments of the community will have different interests. So understanding that and getting the power holders on board may be useful. But the question is, would they want to come on board and how do you approach it? And I'd like and to come in, actually. I, hello? I, I'd like to come in on Marty. Yes, I'd like to come in if I may. Sure. There's two points. One is, and I, you know, it's from being so old, having a 50 year career in this field. Me and you. <laughs> um, is being me. Um, is one is we're not just dealing with patriarchy, right? We're dealing with class, we're dealing with capitalism. I mean, the ready-made garment workers, it's capitalist interests that have made their working conditions so despicable in many ways. So, and the other is that without the collective organization and the collective agency and voice, it's very, very hard for individual women to fight these battles. And so I think the whole, uh, one of the challenges for BRAC is to think about the collective agency, the collective organization, because these are powerful interest groups and it's the intersection of women's identity as women, as workers, as members of poor communities and they're fighting major battles. So the collective is, is critically important. Okay, I think on that, we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, thank you very much. That was a very uh, thought provoking and leaves us with no ready-made answers, but never mind. I think uh, BRAC is a learning organization and it will continue to learn. So our next segment is uh, on uh, one of the ways in which BRAC's learning is communicated and, and, and uh, feeds into development initiatives in other parts of the world. And so we have here Aud Montesquieu, Senior Advisor, Strategy and Digital Innovations for Scaling Economic Inclusion with BRAC Institute of Governance and Development, to be followed by Syed Hashmi, Professor at the School of General Education of BRAC University, and Greg Chen, who's Managing Director of BRAC's Ultra Poor Graduation Initiative. So I'm going to hand over to Aud for about seven minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Naila. So uh, thank, uh, it's a great honor to be here and I'm going to talk about our experience uh, globalizing BRAX uh, targeting the ultra poor uh, approach. Um, in the mid 90s, we heard from Mr. Asif Saleh how BRAC recognized that its uh, anti-poverty economic programs were not reaching the very poorest um, and how BRAC conducted intensive field observations, extensive discussion with its staff um, and with local Local communities and came and came up uh, with a homegrown model uh, to bring about uh, economic and social transformation in the poorest uh, households. The model was named "Challenging the Frontiers of Poverty Reduction," targeting the ultra poor program. It's a bit of a mouthful, but we'll say TUP for short. And uh, TUP has been rolled out by BRAC in Bangladesh uh, from 2002 onwards. Um, the, the model itself consists of a closely monitored, multidimensional, highly sequenced uh, big push intervention over 18 months uh, to help the poorest develop sustainable livelihoods and increase their assets and income and also uh, really significantly minimize their chances of sliding back into extreme poverty. Over the years, BRAC has extended this program to reach over 2 million households uh, with cohorts of 100,000 uh, female heads of households uh, uh, accepted into the program each year. Uh, randomized control trials of the program have shown that there are sizable economic and social impacts of these uh, programs, even uh, many years over, after the program's end. Um, while BRAC's uh, targeting the ultra poor program represented a real breakthrough, um, it was really through strong partnerships that the knowledge was able to globalize. And key champions in global Globalizing this effort with CGAP and the Ford Foundation, and I'm going to speak now about three main takeaways from our experience uh, with Hashmi here in um, 
um, really uh, with the Ford Foundation uh, graduation program, helping this knowledge uh, globalize. So the first is um, piloting and adapting an approach uh, with a thorough research agenda. So um, the CGAP Ford Foundation program started a series of 10 pilots in eight countries um, involving a broad range of partners and with very thorough uh, and extensive re research efforts. There were randomized controlled uh, trial impact assessments in seven of the 10 pilots and then uh, qualitative research in nine of the pilots and mostly under your stewardship, uh, Nyla, um, um, to really try and understand and unpack the stories of change in very poor people's lives. Although uh, BRAC's program was obviously the model, uh, CGAP uh, took very careful care in adapting the, pro the program to change context while remaining true to the vision um, of multidisciplinary, big push, time bound uh, intervention with a very careful uh, emphasis on coaching, hand-holding people on their traje on their upward trajectory. Um, CGAP started uh, using uh, the, the term graduation pathway and then graduation approach rather than graduation model uh, to suggest the necessity of these adaptations. And all the adaptations were really designed and closely monitored with built-in research from the start to understand what was working, what wasn't and why. The second thing I want to emphasize is um, that there was an active community of practice built around this, this pilot effort and a, a deliberate effort to create a drumbeat about this initiative from the start. CGAP was really able to leverage its unique position within the World Bank to convene others around this initiative and, and really see the, um, a future a global movement around graduation and economic inclusion approaches for the very poorest. As of 2009, we started organizing regular global learning events, first in Bangladesh at BRAC, um, in Dhaka, and then in Paris, in Washington, and in different places um, uh, each year. Um, we, we really tried to go beyond the first circle of those implementing, piloting, researching, funding the pilots, and expanding to others um, who might be able to shift the needle within their development agencies or within their governments um, and start including this type of an approach in, in, the, in, their, in their programs. Since the early results were shown to be uh, that the program was having strong impacts of, on the lives of the poorest, we deliberately uh, pushed for the research results to be shared in the form of preliminary findings um, with the idea that we'd be creating a drumbeat around these results and we'd be readying the policymakers uh, to when the results were would be actually published the last thing i uh, i want to talk about is um how partnerships were really essential to influence national policies um, each year we did the rounds uh, in each of the countries where the pilots were implemented and uh, beyond in, in new countries, Philippines, South Africa, Peru, um, and in several states in India, Bihar, Jharkhand, Odisha, to really um, um, uh, seed a dialogue with uh, policymakers a very, with a lot of patience and persistence. We also developed uh, um, tools, state of the sector analysis, uh, costing, costing uh, cost benefit analysis to show the feasibility and the interest of this type of program. Um, and after a 60, uh, six month uh, consultation um, uh, with the community of practice, uh, we really um, realized that this initiative would scale through embedding this type of program onto social protection policy making. And so in 2017, we uh, spun off this work uh, from CGAP and uh, we uh, created 
a new global partnership uh, within the social protection and jobs group of the World Bank. In July uh, 2017, Hashmi and I went over to the Partnership for Economic Inclusion at the World Bank um, and with, with the idea that um, this partnership would help um, accelerate the adoption, the innovation and the scaling of economic inclusion programs by leveraging large what, World Bank investments. You have a minute left. In, and with, by leveraging large World Bank investments in IDA, IDA countries. Thanks a lot and I'll turn Thank over you. to Hashmi. Thank you. Where is Hashmi? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, what I will do is based on what Ode described, I just want to highlight a few reflections from this entire almost 20 year experience of uh, getting the TUP program globalized. The first thing that's important is to, is, was our understanding and our insistence that this be projected as a Southern innovation. Those of us who are in development know very well how often such new ideas, new innovations are either dismissed or hijacked. And it becomes part of Northern theoretical understanding and practice that they then tell us what to do. So for the earlier one, that was very important because that's exactly what it was. Brack's understanding of the lived realities of the poor, from there trying to figure out what are the different ways that poor people are oppressed, from figuring out why are the poorest getting excluded, to coming up with, as, as Asif said, simplified multidimensional responses to be part of the solution. And there what Brad did was combine financial services, social protection, and livelihoods to enable the poorest, who many of them had dismissed as only requiring relief, ensuring that they too had a pathway to take control over the economic lives. So we made sure from, way, from the very beginning that that story becomes, became central, a story of the South developing their own solutions. The second thing that was important was a partnership with the North, but a partnership that depended completely on an understanding of equality of relations, where it was the South coming up with ideas, depending on the North to better expand those ideas and communicate it abroad. But South and BRAC remain central to the discourse. The third thing was, what we did was rather than limiting this to be the backstory and BRAC communicating only with the North, we formed a broad coalition of actors from the South. So coalition of NGOs and practitioners from the South started owning this. And that gave us greater strength to then have these discussions with the World Bank and other multilateral and bilateral agencies, the South leading. Another thing that was central is to bring in the best researchers to focus on the issue. And because at that time, randomistas were dominating the theoretical space of impact. We contracted Ovijit Banerjee and Esther Duplo, who later on went on to become Nobel Prize winners, and Dean Carlin, one of their colleagues, and Nyla to do work on the quality Not an RCT. Assessment. I didn't do an RCT. No, no, no. I, you said you know, <laughs> to do the qualitative assessment. <laughs> I was, I, was just about, I was just saying those. And that provided weight that what Brad did was being validated by the entire international group of the best minds that were, that were there. And that was important. So, and then lastly, we made sure that 
the group that would focus on this, that would lead this within the World Bank, the partnership of economic inclusion, that that BRAC became a central part of that. And BRAC provided grants to the World Bank to allow that happen. So while, of course, the grant size was smaller than what the World Bank was putting in, BRAC provided equal partnership in that too, as one of the funders. The last point I wanted to make was important to discuss with policymakers in their own terms, policymakers from the, from the South. And I'm very happy to report that this has been taken up by many, many, many countries and that this is now part of our development their wisdom. And anybody working with social protection, working with the poorest, always these days talk about this as one of the strategies, whether one adopts it or not, but it becomes part of the social protection discourse on the poorest. Thank you. Thank you. Greg? Yeah, so um, um, great to listen in and, and um, hear the reflections uh, that Ode and Hashimi have had over the last, over the, and they've really uh, pioneered the spread of, of the TUP and graduation approach outside of Bangladesh from, from positions that were adjacent to and closely connected with BRAC historically, but not always within BRAC. And so those relationships with CGAP, where I also worked with Odin Hashimi for some time, um, I was able to um, um, see, see their work and, and, and really admire, frankly, the, the, uh, the longevity and the uh, sophistication with which they approached spreading a good idea from BRAC and the South uh, across the globe. Let me, let me say though, I, I, I might differ with Hashimi and Ode slightly in that I think for, on BRAC's terms that the success of that spread still has several more chapters to go if it's to achieve what we wanted it to achieve. And here I come back to some of the comments from earlier in the discussion, which is the question of scale. And I think graduation has spread and proliferated um, in many small experiments. And so the adaptation side of graduation that Ode referred to has been a major success. It's not a copy paste from Bangladesh. It's rather a spread of core concepts and ideas and principles. Having said that, BRAC um, to its DNA sees this question in terms of the global numbers of extreme poverty and SDG one. And by that pre-COVID numbers, we, we took as a ballpark figure about 100 million households living in extreme poverty and about 500 million people. And if we think about it on those terms, graduation has a huge amount left to do. And, and therefore our strategy in BRAC is to consider how to better influence governments such that they have the confidence to take this up at a scale that can address the problem um, at, at a scale that BRAC has addressed poverty in Bangladesh. So let me just posit that that chapter is still left to be written and, and our success on that is still uncertain. There are a few observations about um, a, global or a global South NGO going and trying to influence and persuade the world. There are advantages to being a global South institution and disadvantages. And um, I'm beginning to learn this a bit better in my new role, but some of the advantages are, I think in Southern, Southern markets and Southern countries, the credibility of BRAC having done it in Bangladesh is just very powerful. And so other Southern governments take notice that this is not an idea coming from somebody's uh, PowerPoint in graduate school, but it's come from uh, practice on the ground. That's a hugely credible and persuasive source. Um, I think the fact that we do it um, at scale in Bangladesh is also you know, an important demonstration capability. But I, I think um, the approach that Ode and Hashmi have taken to spreading it also acknowledge that there are some disadvantages. One is that BRAC was persuaded about the power of graduation long before we had to go get Northern universities involved in, in generating the so-called evidence base. And in order to get the funding and to bring the Northern uh, institutions on, we needed Northern evidence bases. And this is where the randomistas and the RCT became very important. It also became very important to engage CGAP and the World Bank and to develop those kinds of partnerships. 
And I think that's a very sophisticated long-term dance. It doesn't happen just because you think it's a good idea. It takes many years of building those partnerships and spreading that influence. And um, so I just reflect back on uh, some of the real advantages BRAC has in going into this and to remind ourselves that we've got uh, still a long way to go for uh, the graduation work to, to fulfill its true potential to make uh, an impact outside Bangladesh. Um, I think we've got a great chance to do that in the next decade. So let me stop there. Thank you, Nada. Thanks very much to our panelists. Uh, and obviously, addressing extreme poverty is going to be one of the most uh, challenging. So it's not surprising that there's a lot of, you know, um, hiccups on the way and, and a long way to go. I don't think that's uh, anyone underestimates what you're trying to do. Uh, there are a couple of questions, and I don't know if any of you would like to address it. And the two or three questions are revolving around BRAC's relationship with the government, particularly the Bangladesh government. How has that played out? And to, to this panelist, uh, this last panel, I, I, my own question, and that is when we start talking about the poor, the, the ultra poor, etc., we lose sight of what's happening to women in these poor households. And I'd really like to hear what the graduation program, as it gets its eye on the issue of gender inequality within very poor households, because we didn't hear anything much about that. So over to over to the panelists. Any yeah, let me, let me respond to this. I'll start with the, the second one. Uh, as Sohela and others were talking about, um, the way it happened in Bangladesh in the first instance, the first step was to provide resources to women, psychological support and everything, so that within the household, they would be more confident and assertive. But then the second, and, and of course, managing their own economic lives. The second level would have been getting them organized and building collective agency. And I just want to say that while maybe BRAC hasn't gone that far for various reasons we've heard, I've been following very closely the replication in, well, I wouldn't say replication, the adaptation in India. In Bihar, for example, it's a government, the state government is leading this. And the state government has used its own finances to make this, to, to, to have the program include 100,000 women, and now it's expanding. And within that framework, they use the SHGs. They have the poorest women be better integrated in the SHGs. Women running producer co-ops or producer companies, so having greater control over their businesses, being part of the value chain. Women mobilizing for maybe not for major political activities, but definitely local government demanding rights at the local government level, electing at the local government. So this is an indication of what we were talking about, how to get to the next step. And the next step definitely has to be, and I'm, this was as part of BRAC's DNA, it just has, hasn't happened, where you build collectives, you build collective organization, and you build collective agency to bring about to have some transformation in existing structures of oppression. The first question, BRAC with the government, while BRAC has had tremendous success in like education and health, uh, working with the government, um, in here they haven't, and I think BRAC needs to reflect on, I mean, I've got my own ideas why, but that's a separate story. However, the one great thing that Abin Pai did in his visionary way of looking, situating BRAC is bringing in as the chair of BRAC someone who has close ties, maybe not I'm talking about OAB League, but the bureaucracy, who has great convening power with the bureaucracy. In fact, that's why in the five-year plan, graduation in our social protection program, uh, the government plans, it's there. So now the next step would be working on that, making sure that graduation, and for BRAC, it's not just graduation, all of social protection. And I think we're at the cusp of that happening, far greater closer coordination with the government. I, just, I, I can see it happening. Thank you. 
Um, any other comments? I'll just see if there's any. So most of it is really the last few questions are all about Brack's relationship with government. And I wonder if Asif wanted to come in or. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, and I, I just want to echo that uh, on the, uh, the graduation side, it's a it's an ongoing work in progress. Uh, we are uh, sort of making a bit more headway in terms of uh, looking to see if we can help the government in targeting. So we have changed our strategy rather than trying to sell the entire model, uh, looking at parts of the model. Uh, we just recently uh, got uh, sort of an approval from the Social Affairs Ministry to identify people with disability in the community who can work uh, and get the sort of the government allowances. So, so that's it's a small step, but it's the first step towards getting uh, sort of BRAC's community power involved in the targeting process, where which is a which is one of the major areas of challenges in, in this kind of social protection program. And the second thing is, I would say that, you know, it has been quite uh, complementary, the relationship with the government uh, historically has been. I mean, I talked about the immunization where the entire country was curved up and uh, and government took a role and then BRAC was given a, a side of the country and, and we did the delivery. Um, uh, but at that time in the 80s, the state's capacity was a lot less. Uh, now, sitting in 2020, there's a lot more capacity. Bangladesh has grown uh, in terms, has become more prosperous. So it's, and also sort of some of the needs which required our national presence that is not there anymore. So, so on one hand, I think there are emerging problems that like youth unemployment, what are the solutions? I think government is working with us and also looking for models that uh, that they can take up the on. You, uh, there is like adolescent clubs that we started in the in the late 90s. Just government in uh, this year's budget has uh, took that model and and have allocated budget for 6,000 adolescent clubs. They're implementing it. But I think from a model development and selling the model and demonstrating through advocacy, there has been big successes in that and also in pre uh, so the pre-primary education, which and then now we are working on the ECD. So those have been, have been very, very uh, useful examples. And also recently we have, uh, we are for the first time uh, doing our school implementation for out of school children at the one room school model that we talked about and, and sending them to the formal schools with the revenue budget from the government uh, uh, in two districts. So that has never happened before. So this is a shift from donor funding to government funding to implement some of the existing models. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we just have a couple of minutes and I'm gonna take up uh, one of those minutes to go back to the question that Sam Hickey posed about re the responsabilization of women. You know, we, we come up with these concepts in, in academia, but they don't always apply in the same way across the world. Giving res women responsibility as service providers in Bangladesh, requiring women to take on loans, etc was actually quite important in breaking down the barriers to women's mobility and opportunity. And the only way we could have got these services to women is through other women. So the word responsabilization, yes, I can see that women were taking a disproportionate responsibility for some of the progress that has been made, but it was also quite an important way of bringing them in to the mainstream of development Whereas up till that point, and even up till today, they remain, if not on the margins, but really on the sidelines. And I think this business of getting them out into the public domain more safely so that they can uh, avail themselves of a wider range of opportunities is for me, the next very big challenge. How does one make public space safe? Okay, that's my little uh, uh, two cents to this uh, conversation. But uh, we have exactly one minute, so I'll just say, Thank you very much to a great set of presentations from people, you know, very much embedded within BRAC, but also, as I said earlier, fellow travelers who have been researching BRAC and are aware of its limitations, but also its enormous strengths. And just the staying power of BRAC, I think, speaks for itself. So uh, goodbye, everyone. And uh, I hope you got all your goodbye. questions answered. Bye-bye. Thank you.